Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and support our new movement by putting Let's Go Viral in the comment section. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review. But without further ado, here are your hosts, Nicely Chunk of Benny and Greg King. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast, members of the Off the Ball Network. And in today's episode, we're going to be doing our first breakdown of the NBA Finals. We're going to be talking about, you know, what went wrong and what went right for both Golden State and the Boston Celtics. But before we get started with today's episode, if you guys are new to our YouTube channel or you're listening on any other podcast streaming platform, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on our YouTube pages. And be sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review on all podcast streaming platforms. But without further ado, let's get started with game. Game two's breakdown of the NBA Finals because you know heading into this matchup there were some things that Boston definitely was able to benefit from and obviously in game one game one was the one game that I thought it was going to be the best chances for Boston but to have an advantage if they had any due to the fact that this is an opponent that Golden State wasn't very familiar with now across the entire landscape of the NBA everybody understands you know Boston great switch heavy defense you know they've got the rim protection a lot of interchangeable parts defensively you know multiple point of attack defenders size athleticism you name it and not to mention the depth right those attributes definitely worked in their favor but for the most part you know I, I thought those were some of the things that you know Boston was going to be able to hang their hat on and luckily they were able to overcome that third quarter avalanche that Golden State you know was able to provide in game one and ultimately come out with a win great job closing out the game by guys like Al Horford for Peyton Pritchard, you know, he he got his number called over Marcus Smart in the fourth quarter. That's a conversation that a lot of people haven't had. But let's talk about game two. And I, the reason why I brought up game one was because what Boston was able to accomplish here in game two in the first half has a lot to do with what happened in game one. Now, in game one, Boston was able to knock down 21 three-point shots. They shot, what, 51% from beyond the arc, spaced the floor out really well capitalize on all the opportunities where they had corner kicks jason tatum hitting guys on cross-court passes with the throwback option number of things right with that being said golden state ironically you know they they gave up a lot of uncontested shots on the perimeter in game one so heading into game two we knew that they weren't going to be as lax from that standpoint and that actually also benefited and played into boston's favor in the first half because understandably they were able to have enough guys who can you know penetrate into the lane beat you off the dribble and you know kind of identify those open players in a half court setting especially when you're able to force this golden state warriors defense to collapse now you know jason tatum and jalen brown were phenomenal in the first half specifically jalen brown you know he he's been doing a great job in terms of you know just attacking off the bounce immediately as soon as he gets the ball to that dribble handoff action and he's typically going to have a smaller defender guarding him whether it be jordan Poole or someone like that you know he was able to take advantage of those opportunities right and i think it's, it's really important for boston to really start these games out on a hot note because we understand with golden state's outside three-point shooting capabilities they're going to be able to play from behind and have a legitimate shot of coming back against boston in any game throughout this series especially when boston has a offensive tempo and they play a similar pace for the entire 48 minutes of a ball game and not to mention you know boston they don't with them not having a true floor general on the floor i mean we understand what marcus smart can do from that perspective and jason tatum you know him being the main primary initiator of this offense we know exactly what those guys can do in terms of you know just having an effect on the game from those different angles but they don't have a guy like chris paul like the phoenix suns who's able to you know allow them to play not only fast but they can also play slow and slow the game down. They don't have a Luka Doncic. They don't have guys like that, right? So with them playing at this same high speed pace, it actually kind of plays into Golden State's favor a little bit more rather than, you know, Boston's, especially when Boston isn't taking a good care of the basketball in a half court setting. And we saw a lot of that tonight, You're right? You know, despite them getting off to a pretty good start in the first half, you know, they still had 11 turnovers, you know, seven turnovers in the first quarter, 11 turnovers going to the half. And Boston isn't one of those teams where, you know, they're going to turn the ball over trying to make the right pass and things of that nature you know it's typically going to be some live ball turnovers due to forced passes trying to get the basketball to guys who aren't open I, I saw a lot of times tonight where Marcus Smart and Jason Tatum specifically attacking the middle of that painted area and you know especially on Tatum drives you know Tatum's drawing two to three and sometimes even four defenders with his gravitational pull right so for him to you know try to 
make these dump off passes to Daniel Tice or Al Horford when the paint is extremely congested in the dunker spot. It, it just doesn't make a lot of sense for you. And they weren't able to benefit off the lob pass tonight with Robert Williams just because, you know, Robert, he wasn't able to really have much of an effect on the game tonight just because Golden State did a good job in terms of, you know, not having their initial defender get beat off the dribble, at least in the second half. In the first half, it was a much different story. You know, guys were getting beat off the dribble left and right. And I think a lot of that also has to do with type of lineups, you know, Steve Kerr's putting out there. I think in this series, it's definitely going to be a lot more beneficial for Boston to stay playing big in my opinion, because when you try to match Golden State small ball lineups, you can really put yourself in a predicament because typically, and, and understandably knowing, I've been on record of saying this is the best defense that I've seen in my entire 13 years of watching NBA basketball. You know, I started watching the game when I was 10 years old. I'm 23 now, and I can't think of another defense where I can recall where, you know, they just had so many interchangeable parts. They had a lot of guys that you could rely on depth-wise, and, you know, they could just do a lot of disrupting despite going up against high-powered offenses, right? Right? But I think, you know, with Golden State's small ball lineup, when you have lineups that include Wiggins, Otto Porter Jr., Draymond Green at the five, Jordan Poole, and then Stephen Curry, it's going to be really tough to, you know, match those guys, not only offensively, but defensively. Something that Golden State struggles with, and, you know, it, it's actually an, an advantage point for Boston, is dealing with Boston's size and athleticism and things of that nature. That was a big subject for the first half of this game, you know. Golden State had a lot of opportunities off the rim. Boston did pay attention to the scouting report, running guys off the three-point line allowing them to get all the way to the rim and you know they, and Boston was able to come up with seven blocks tonight but a lot of the shot attempts that Golden State had at the rim you know they missed them and most of them were some pretty good looks you know but I think what rattled Golden State from that perspective and the reason why they missed so many chippies around the basket had a lot to do with them you know expecting a lot of contact from you know Boston's you know very physical defense you know so I think that played with their heads just to a certain degree right but let's move on let's talk about the third quarter because that essentially was the story of the game, right? Golden State's really good in the third quarter. They're probably the best third quarter team of all time. I don't know if statistical metrics support that statement, but they were able to hold Boston to 14 points in the third quarter, right? And like I mentioned, I talked about the turnover, a lot of them being live ball turnovers. And, you know, th those live ball turnovers really ignited uh, Golden State's transition. I think this is a game where if you just take care of the basketball and, you know, maybe you commit half of those turnovers. You know, they gave 19 extra possessions tonight. Golden State was able to capitalize off that 33 points off of those turnovers. You know, they were plus 18 from that standpoint. Boston lost this game by 19 points. That definitely probably, you know, changes the overall dynamic of this, not only this game, but this series because you would be up 2-0 if you just take care of things in the fourth quarter because the fourth would look a lot different. Ime Odoku wouldn't have to sit Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and the rest of these starters and who knows what the outcome of this ball game looks like right but you know another talking point as far as jason tatum and jalen brown i mean in the second half those guys were completely shunned steve kerr had a great adjustment by putting draymond green on jalen brown for a lot of the third quarter in the second half draymond is he's gonna be a lot more physical and you know a little bit more disruptive defensively he's a much better one-on-one -on -one defender matching up against a guy like jalen brown who ideally isn't the greatest ball handler in the world and you know he doesn't do the best job in terms of separation what he was able to benefit in these first two games scoring the basketball was him being able to you know get smaller defenders switched on him at a, a dho action and just being able to shoot over the top of these guys and get to his designated spot and you know really just being comfortable getting into his shot right but you know with draymond green on you that's a completely different story right another adjustment that i want to talk about as far as the golden state warriors now draymond green has been fairly inconsistent throughout this entire postseason whether we're talking about his shooting his playmaking ability his aggressiveness and things of that nature he's been fairly inconsistent he's been pretty up and down for this postseason and in game one boston was able to force him to take 12 shot attempts which is you know kind of a hefty amount of field goal attempts if you're talking about a guy like draymond green who isn't the most proficient scorer in the league let alone on your team right but tonight he did a much better job in terms of getting the shots that he wanted rather than being baited into shooting, you know, a lot of perimeter shots outside. But and to a degree, Boston was definitely able to, you know, benefit defensively defending the Golden State Warriors in a short roll action or in pick and pop scenarios because of the Draymond's lack of gravity outside. So what Steve Kerr was able to do tonight, they'd be at least to some spot minutes. That way they could have a threat and pick and pop action. And I thought that really, you know, kind of helped swing the overall course of this game to a certain degree, obviously. And uh, another thing I want to talk about with Golden State, you know, typically, you know, heading into this series, we were expecting a lot of split action within their offense in a half court setting. 
but it's been primarily a lot of Stephen Curry high screen, high ball screens and things of that nature, right? Which is weird because ideally Boston is a defense that prefers to, you know, defend against isolation based offenses. We saw them have success with that against the Brooklyn Nets in the first round. We saw them have success with that against Milwaukee in the second round. But, you know, Boston, they like I mentioned in the, uh, earlier in the episode, they have a lot of interchangeable parts, a lot of point of attack guys who can, you know, take on some of those one on one matchups, depending on who it is. Right. And I thought that was really weird for Golden State to kind of bypass their split action offense. Right. I think some of it has to do with the fact that, you know, they haven't had a ton of guys outside of Stephen Curry really be able to punish them in those scenarios. You know, guys like Andrew Wiggins and Otto Porter Jr., they're going to be very key in this series. The same thing for Klay Thompson, because outside of Stephen Curry, one gripe about this Golden State Warriors offense that, you know, I think hasn't been talked about enough is the fact that, you know, their wings, they don't have a lot of guys who can, you know, just punish off mismatches on the perimeter from that standpoint, right? You know, that was what made them so unstoppable when they acquired Kevin Durant, because ideally you have a split action offense. The cutting action is going to be great. The spacing is going to be there. But the one missing piece and the one gripe about their half court offense, all those years was the fact that you know they didn't have guys who could punish those mismatches on the perimeter from a wing standpoint and just being able to you know be effective from that dynamic that's why kelly Oubre didn't work out those are just a few of the blemishes that this team had from the offensive perspective but all in all you know golden state something that i was going to keep an eye on had to do with not only what they were able to do in pick and roll scenarios because obviously stephen curry he had a tough time dealing with you know boston's ability to you know play high in those scenarios and like i talked about earlier in the episode the physical traits was definitely bothersome and you know golden state like i mentioned wasn't very familiar with boston when it comes to the adjustments and some of the overall schemes that they were going to utilize against them. those are some things that definitely benefited them um, in that first game but for whatever reason in the third quarter specifically al horford he's sitting in the drop coverage Stephen Curry was able to, you know, knock down a few shots from that dynamic, getting all the way to the rim, make things happen out of those actions. And a lot of it pr probably has to do with the fact that with Robert Williams, a little bit hobbled, not 100% in this series. Idoka was trying to protect him a little bit. You know, he there was an instance in the game where Marcus Smart fell into his leg and they don't want to put Robert Williams in a tough situation. So unfortunately, Al Horford had to be the person that you know got a lot of the coverages on curry tonight but unfortunately it just didn't work out and golden state you know it, during the non-curry minutes and i think they were able to solve it tonight you know sp specifically in the second half more so too but during the non-curry minutes they have to find better rotations and lineups that are going to be implemented where they can score the basketball at an efficient rate and and not take too much away from their defense because top to bottom boston is more than likely is the better two-way team as far as being able to score score the basketball at an efficient rate and being able to limit golden state on the opposing side that's been a tough adjustment for steve kerr to be able to figure out but more importantly i wouldn't say they necessarily solved that problem tonight i think more so the story of the game has to be the points off turnovers you know when you're giving up 33 points off turnovers and you gave away 19 possessions that you could have utilized to score the basketball and keep things close you know that changes the overall dynamic of this game but you know with all that stuff being said Boston, they still have the leverage in this series, given the fact that, you know, they came into game one, took care of business, split things, and now they have the home court advantage within this series. But Jason Tatum, he must be better. He's got to do a much better job in terms of processing, you know, defenses and things of that nature. And, you know, just trying not to be as forceful and doing a better job of picking and choosing his spots. Because, you know, Stephen Curry, he, it seems like they're more than likely Golden State is going to continue to allow him to get switched on to Jason Tatum. And they're going to have guys shade over. And I understand Tatum wants to be a playmaker, but at the same time, let's mix some of that passing with your scoring capability as well. This was a guy that made first team all NBA. We expect you to give us 27 a night, 26 points a night off decent efficiency. So with that being said, want to see the adjustments out of you know Ime Adoka and the rest of his Boston Celtics defense I think if they take care of the basketball well and ultimately you know they can get some more help from their role players because Marcus Smart was passive aggressive tonight same thing for Al Horford those guys didn't have a lot of field goal attempts I think Boston will be in good shape if they're able to you know tweak some of those things but hey you guys let me know what y'all think about this here in the comment section thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode with me here on the ball fake podcast if you're new to our youtube channel or listening on any other podcast streaming platform make sure to like comment and subscribe turn on post notification give us a five star rating and a nice review on all podcast streaming platforms but besides that it's your boy nicey chunga Benny. you're listening to the ball fake podcast and we out praise god